that some of my guests have been approached by old Homeland Security or FBI saying, oh, uh, why are you going on the Clay Douglas show? My message to those guys that they're listening this morning is, go get a cup of coffee, maybe you'll learn something. We both took the same you know, to defend the Constitution against all enemies foreign and domestic. I don't recall there being an expiration date on that. Well, it's the free American, Clay Douglas. <laughs> For the podcast and more details, visit www.freeamerican.com or catch the podcast by phone by calling 832-999-8621. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a, another edition of the Free American. I am your host, I am Clay Douglas, and uh, my guests today are William Blair and Art George. Art, are you with me? Uh, yes, I am, Clay. All right, great, great to have you back on, and William, I know I've got you up. I want to, uh, I think I've got you up, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> sure do. All right. I uh, I want to just kind of do a, an introduction with you today because uh, what we're going to be talking about is something that's in the headlines, but people aren't, they're not talking about it on television. They're not talking about it in the schools. They'll tell you that uh, we've got... Uh, immigration, uh, we've got uh, Muslims are being coming in, we've got people from Syria, Muslims from Syria are being uh, coming in, which is kind of a scam too. They want you to be afraid of Syrians because they want to make them into the enemy, in my opinion. But what we're really talking about here is weaponized immigration, and the model of weaponized immigration according to the information on infrospect.org, is centuries old. The uh, basis of the model is a military civilian known as interdiction strategy campaigns. The modern air weaponized immigration model relies upon the public perception of management, conversational hypnosis, media narrations concerning a deep Hispanic immigration, deep Latino immigration, the dynamic aspects required, international applications of austerity programming to construct a high-risk environment uh, that is a genocide, atrocity, holocaust, austerity, sequestration, abandonment of real and personal property, consolidation of a real estate under corporate stakeholder ownership, and abrogation of reserved individual liberty replaced with practical sovereignty and supervised individual privileges. Basically, the 1966 Coward Piven strategy has been revisited and is in play. E.g., that uh, means uh, collapsing every societal aspect of America, social, economic, environmental. The damage output is known as Convergent impact and effect, effect, 
the overreaching, over um, reaching capstone doctrine, interdependence and inoperability mandated the commingling of civilian, military, judicial, executive, and legislative department of sovereign governments into the global collaborative governance secular political ideology. So what you're seeing happening in Europe and America, in Europe they are running in the Muslims into the European rapes, thefts is just a, a fraction of the story that's going on there and the same thing is happening here and been happening here in the last century, and that is the influx of Hispanics, Catholics into this country, who they're being controlled by, who they're being run by, it could be the uh, Zionists, could be the uh, Israel, and uh, you know, toss a coin, flip a coin, six or one, half a dozen on another. William, you want to tell us? Uh, Give us a uh, where where you want to go with this. What are we what are we talking about? I think we're we're at high risk. And on the other hand, let me let me say this, and you can toss this in the mix of what we're going to be talking about. What I've been studying over the last week is that we really have we really have uh, the answers here, and possibly had the answers for a hundred years. We've got the answers to our energy problems. So we've got the uh, the control of the gas companies, the oil companies. It's uh, It's been negated by some discoveries. You're not hearing about them on the mainstream, but there is actually more power, enough power to run the country for a thousand years it could be found in a grain of sand. Silicon, uh, the, the new technology of the graphene, converting the graphite into uh, one atom thick sheets that are stronger than steel and absorb electricity, generate electricity, can be used in batteries and can be used for uh, myriad of other effects. We don't need the gas, we don't need the oil, we don't need uh, this kind of control, and we damn sure don't need nuclear power plants that you're paying $200 a month for to get your power, get your electricity. We've got, and that, that could blow up on you at any time, it could become Chernobyl, it could be, uh, become, uh, you know, the catastrophe in Japan is poisoning our food supply because all of that could be replaced with thorium. We've really had the answers for a hundred years and the information I've got says that there's uh, the energy I guess uh, Tesla called it the ether. It's uh, energy from the sun but not necessarily sunlight, but it's floating around and they have got the technology to use this. We can make sheets of this graphene that are so thin that they have no weight, practically, and we could put them on the windows of our high rises and turn every high rise office building into a power generating plant. So at the same time that we're talking about this uh, influx of immigrants, illegal aliens that are robbing and stealing and killing and murdering uh, Americans. All of the answers are here. All of the answers are here, I believe, and just being kept from us. Go ahead, William. Oh, good morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, today's subject, obviously, is weaponized immigration, and it is, it is uh, well laid out in the intrusions uh, case file I have in front of me, it stands at 797 pages on the brief, and then as well as in uh, indigenous identity theft and fraud, which is a, a brief at about 417 pages. Now, one of the, one of the social strategies 
that uh, people face all over the world is always uh, this approach by the change agents to simplify things, to essentially make people simple-minded. And to do that, you have to create a linguistic uh, frame of words and a conversation and a dialogue that really doesn't go anywhere except into functioning within the dysfunction. Now, as you mentioned, you know, you look, you look into something, you say, what is it in itself? And as you, uh, you can characterize the immigration uh, from Mexico and so forth here. But one thing, when you slow the thought process down and you take it step by step, you, you identified something that's very important, and that is that we're bringing in a massive amount of people. And you said, well, we have all of these technologies. We have all of these technologies. And it's quite an array of technologies on the planet. So why do we need these semi-skilled and unskilled workers? Why do we need them? Well, the fact of the matter is that we, there is another purpose. What is the purpose of immigration? Now, when we talk about immigration, we have to actually look at what is immigration. And we're going to be talking about citizenship and passports. What are, what are these instruments? What are, what are they about? And I can tell you this, that the uh, INS, the Immigration Naturalization Service, has devised uh, approximately 100 question tests for immigrants. Now, from reviewing that test, it's obvious that any American uh, out there is probably not going to be able to uh, qualify as a, a citizen or as a, uh, a patriot. And I can exemplify that by saying uh, two question tests. You know, who was the first U.S. Postal Service person? Who was the first chief? Another question would be, what essays inspired the Constitution? Well, those are fairly important questions when you think you're coming to America and you think you're going to be free. So what has happened in this weaponized process, it has become quite devious. Now, it's not devious because I call it devious. It's devious because of a long, long history of what is weaponized immigration. When you look at the word citizen, citizen of the United States, you will find very clearly that there is uh, a lawful definition to that, and it's owing allegiance, owing allegiance to the United States of America, to the people as the sovereign. And in it, it talks uh, about the definitions of, of several casts of citizens, very, very tight types of citizens. And by the time you get through that, you start realizing that, well, this involves an allegiance. And allegiance is to a sovereign people. Allegiance is not a loyalty oath to the Bar Association, to a municipal uh, corporation. Allegiance is a goes to the body politic. And what has happened in the body politic as the sovereignty is collapsed to international institutions, it requires that you have loyalty that's supreme and superior to your oath of allegiance as a citizen to the people of the sovereign. Now, I'm sure Art will, George will join us uh, today. And when you're looking at the history of weaponized immigration, you're looking into uh, centuries of strategies and things, things that invented things that have been put in place. The 
the actual collapsing of sovereignty to the international institutions is it, it's a game. It's a game that's on right now, and there is a purpose to it. The last decades, all the way from the 60s, have been um, fairly well convoluted by uh, people masquerading themselves in civil rights movements and so forth. But always the, the synthesis in weaponized immigration is to bring in a compromising population of immigrants. And immigration uh, becomes a matter of naturalization. And, and as far as I'm concerned, that's sophistry. It's not naturalization, it's unnaturalization. Because the citizen becomes property. They become chattel in a different kind of strategy. The UN Charter uh, smells good, tastes good, looks good, but really in terms of indigenous people, it goes to the collusive presumption, which was written by the State Department, the Holy See, and a UN executive. And basically, it <laughs> assigns the definition that power to define and adjudicate matters of spiritual property. Well, how did it get that far? Well, it got that far because there was always a synthesis. The synthesis was always, we must collapse authority to the higher cause. We have always the global context. I'm not picking on NPR and PRI and KLCC and these families of corporate radio stations per se, but they seem to have mastered how to to use a lot of sophistry and speech encoding that distracts people into very dysfunctional emotions. How do you feel about this? And at that point, you can play um, the blame cards, the anger cards, or the rescuer thing. Or you can do anything you want because people are in a dysfunctional mindset. The actualities are that the mechanism that is involving this soft, weaponized immigration are fairly well depicted and planned in uh, uh, instruments like the Millennium Development Goals, UN. Uh, Agenda 21, uh, the League of Cities, the International Organization for Standardization, which uh, goes into uh, environmental management systems, such as the Forest Stewardship Council, uh, Sustainable Forestry Interests, uh, the IMF, and a host of um, umbrella organizations and corporations under a theme of uh, globally integrated enterprises. Now, basically what I'm saying is you're looking at a corporate world, and, and that can be reasonably defined as uh, fascism not communism or Marxism, because those are, those are mecha mechanisms to get to the end product. And the end product is a product called the quality of life. And that is uh, a product that is sold through the agency taxation, inflation rates, uh, floating currency exchange rates, and then obviously the private, so-called private government partners who are making money off selling the quality of life. The important parts that are very understandable is that the immigrants coming in certainly uh, have a personality from Mexico. Uh, the, the fear, the distraction is obviously to ISIS and to um, the various other uh, labeled enemies of the state. But what is carefully omitted and carefully concealed uh, through the various apparatuses like the, uh, the end game of the North American Union, things like this, is that you're getting screening points put in place. Now, the screening points come into place, and there's some fairly simple-minded things uh, that 
this is put into a social context such as uh, immigrants, Hispanic immigrants work harder and are better employees, and those, uh, those white guys, they don't want to work. These are fairly simple-minded little deductions meant to play on the public's ignorance. And there's two kinds of ignorance. There's culpable ignorance, which lawyers do a lot for their clients, and there's uh, a willful ignorance, which the public in itself uh, finds the lowest hanging fruit. Now, if we're going to talk about the Hispanic labor, that you know, that global labor, that uh, global work uh, pass, are better workers, then I would simply ask um, all of the corporations all of the authorities and agencies involved, I would like to examine the work performance evaluations, just like anybody that has in a business, whether you evaluate your employees. I want to examine those. I want to look at those and see how it was established that they're better workers. I want to see the collective documentation by the EEOC, by labor and industries, and I want to see exactly and precisely a summary of the evaluation of these better working people. Well, that, that isn't there, and that isn't going to happen. And the reason is that you may have contractors coming in uh, to the United States, and the various agencies really are taking advantage of the immigrant, the, the so-called immigrants, and they're getting... One basic part of this is, is superior to us, and that is that they're cheap, cheap labor for Republicans and Democrats, and they make a lot of money for the stakeholder agencies in terms of illegality is money. The more illegality there is, there is a crime does pay, and, it's, and it pays a lot of people to uh, prosecute this so-called undocumented uh, immigrancy. Now, really, okay, let's back up a little bit. Let's let's say, what what? Wait a second here. These are nice, touchy-feely words, uh, uh, very suitable depending on your political party association. Undocumented uh, undocumented immigrant is a nice term. And it's really <laughs> soft. It means that we're going to talk about this in policy and administrative context. It doesn't go to what really is happening, and that is the felony exit, crossing the border, and entry to and from the United States and the states. In other words, there's a state boundary and there's an international boundary. So really, we're talking about felony prosecution. Okay, let's talk about that. There are several U.S. district attorneys that can come forward and say, we don't even want to handle these kinds of cases because the, the trespasser is likely to waiver rights and do plea bargains and become a victim and create a victimology that spins off into deteriorating the rights, privilege, and due process usually afforded to citizens. Plea bargaining is one of the most abused things going on in immigration today. Now, as it moves forward, say, okay, who are the beneficiaries? Who are they? Well, first we have the, the, the frontline beneficiaries, and that's the people involved in the cross-border felony entries and exits. But then it goes further. We go into deep immigration. And deep immigration is where you start uh, creating and inventing little projects. Little projects like, uh, gee, the kids were born here in the United States, or we have to bring the children uh, from the poor people of Mexico and save them from the gangsters. And these are nice social justice ideas. They don't, they don't bear out in the fine land, they fail because they're designed to fail. As we get into this, when we talk about this today, there's going to be it's going to be shocking to a lot of folks that have been uh, in, 
basically kept in a stupor and a uh, uh, conversational hypnosis as to what weaponized immigration is. Weaponized immigration has been all over the planet. Some of the classic historical examples were the uh, the uh, war on terror against the constitutional loyalists of Ireland. And that was created, invented, and executed against them. And it was under the war on terror. Isn't that interesting? That's 1919. The other weaponized immigrations are very visible. It doesn't matter in the Middle East what's going on now. It, wherever it is in the world, it always is weaponized immigration. First, to get get the high risk going, you need to impact and create create the stressors. And the way you do that is you go in with a bunch of uh, political front faces, uh, but really with lawyers and uh, technologists and scientists and sociologists running it, and you create uh, austerity. You start stressing the sovereign. You stress the people. You stress there. The, um, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Is that right there? Yeah, sir. Yeah, yeah, I've been here. I didn't know. If, I didn't know if you guys knew I was here. Oh, is this David? <laughs> Dave, we've got David on uh, from Louisiana. He's joined us uh, as a as a call-in guest, and of course we've got Art. And it was uh, the show I did with Art uh, a few days ago that made uh, David want to join us. He was uh, pretty impressed here. And let me let me uh, say something else about this weaponized immigration. I think the greatest example of that, and please correct me, Art and William, if I'm wrong here, but the greatest historical example of weaponized immigration is us. <laughs> we, we were sitting here under, uh, you know, what divine rights or something like that to take over this country and kill off most of the indigent population here and I'd also like to remind people that if you go back in time and look at the civilizations that the indigenous people of America you can call them Indians if you want if you're comfortable with that but uh, the indigenous population built structures and cities that we can't duplicate today. Would you uh, care to comment on that? And this is one of the things that Art and I talked about when he came on my show a couple of days ago, uh, that I think the American uh, Indians were right in what they did. And the way they lived, the whole idea of teepees with the modern with the modern uh, uh, materials that we have today, and I'm speaking specifically uh, about graphene, you could make teepees out of graphene, pack them up, roll them up, and they're stronger than steel. It traps the heat, it traps electricity, it generates electricity. We could, uh, we could, if we redesigned our self-sufficient family farms, away got away from these crappy wood buildings that they gave us and uh, used the designs that the American indigenous people lived in for thousands of years would be a hell of a lot better off. And we do have, uh, again, David from Louisiana with us. David, are you with us, sir? Yes, sir. Okay, if, you got, if you've got a question or something... You, Go ahead. Uh, who, who, who? Don't mean to. Don't mean to run over everybody. Wait, go. Before we go right ahead, before sir. Before we go any further, I need to hear from uh, from Art. Are you still with us, Art? Yeah, I'm just uh, waiting patiently here. Okay. Uh, before we go any further, Art, would you kindly have a prayer for all of us, and then I would like to listen to what you have to say. All right. Thank you, David. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, 
Um, it's really interesting that we do say a prayer before we uh, uh, go on because, uh, like we did when William and I went to a law conference up in Oregon, uh, the people up there, after, after every meeting we had with different rooms, we wanted to do a prayer. And the people up there said, well, we don't pray for every, every time we, uh, we meet. And, and that, that's uh, uh, something that the original people of this country did, is we always give thanks and we always want the protection of the spirits and the uh, ancestors that were here before us, including land, animal, air, and water. And so I really appreciate that, David, of, of recognizing that, because that that's what I wanted to do before I spoke. ああ、ディグレットキティダラオダスカトマンガオ。ドゲーアーババタンマ。ドロットトーニ、デゲンディアレイワシティショ。ダトモシャ。ダスカトマンガオ。ハンガラオシ。ハンガラオシ。
Indian Reorganization Act. And out of the 100% of Washoe's that voted, only 40% voted yes or no. And so they took out of that 40%, the, the percentage of, of, of voters that said yes, and they agreed to adopt this constitution. And since that time, 60% of the population has been struggling uh, because this new new IRA system doesn't encompass the values of the of the people, doesn't include values of the natural law, doesn't include the natural um, uh, pathway of how people can get along and organize and be a part of the environment they live in. And I and I always see this as, as a real hard line of of, of of changing the original way think way to do things, and I think uh, it's called uh, values neutral. And it's taking the original values and putting them into the into an area where now all of a sudden a foreign uh, system can replace it. And most people don't understand. And I'm really appreciative of the way that William can explain a lot of this because uh, some of us have only been into this history for, you know, like my, my people here for 300 years. And William talking about history that happened way before we even had any changes. And so when we're talking about this whole design system, I mean, they're playing us all for a... Uh, 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 they're playing us all for our ignorance and not knowing this information. And for us all to be here together right now and be able to speak together on these subjects is, is very, very important because the design that's in front of us is, uh, there's, a, there's a, a portion of us that are just uh, um, consumers, I guess you'd call us. And, and the other people that are above us, in a sense, are those that have all the money that they can ever have. They can never spend it all. And they continue to dictate to our, our lives and dictate to the, to the lives of the land, animal, air, and the water while we are falling short and, and starving and homeless and, and uh, going without. They continue to, to take advantage of that. And so I think uh, it's, it's really important to, to understand that what we're talking about here, the weaponized immigration, is, is really a, um, an ignorance on our part because we just haven't stepped up to the plate and we've allowed people to play us. And when it comes to the design that they're carrying out, the lawyers and judges right now are, are, are backing up that play and committing fraud committing crimes against nature just as uh, um, they did when they came when the people came here and took over this land the federal system uh, uh, federal government made a lot of promises and in this day today a lot of the promises are being broken because they're playing the, the people of this country that that established themselves as states the states don't recognize the Indian title or don't recognize the Indian history because they said the government has already dealt with us. And so the, the American people or the American population is just moving forward with the design that fits their needs. But their values are still being tested. And as they try to design themselves as, as a people with democracy or that created democracy, that whole population is excluding the original population of this country that were the originators of this democracy, which was borrowed by the founding fathers of this country when they created the Declaration of Independence. And so this whole design that's being played on us all, it's only because we're ignorant. We don't have as much information as, as, as we need in order to make just decisions just as some of the uh, uh, decisions that are being made in my tribe here. In the very beginning when I was a kid, I remember there was respect for the old people, respect for those that had, had experience for the things that they've done and think what kind of uh, person they were. And, and when, uh, when the old people spoke, 
They spoke in the entirety of everything that they had to say. Nobody jumped in over them and talked over them, which people do nowadays. Everybody's got to say, this is America. We can say whatever we want. We, can, we, we have the freedom to speak. But you know, back in the old days, respect is not just the old days. Respect is today, too. And so uh, in order for us to uh, get back to uh, an original system of values, we can't, we can't be ignorant, and we can't continue to talk over each other. There are those that have the experience to really help us get out of this mess we're in by sharing the knowledge and, the, and, and what they have to offer. And so, I, like I said, I really appreciate that the, the, the roundtable of people that were starting to acquire who uh, played Douglas in his show. Um, it, it's, it's been a long time needed for this design, and like William says, for us to slow down, to really uh, ingest what it is we need to know in order to uh, combat or to resolve the conflicts and the problems we have here on Earth. Because there's a lot of mismanagement and misuse of things, and people are taking advantage of that. Now, let me, uh, we talked about uh history in the past uh, the last time you were on my show Art but uh, what I just mentioned the fact that uh, we they really used us as some of us uh, Anglo-Saxons were kidnapped were hijacked were uh, shanghaied brought over here to America and they set us against the natives and created this whole thing, and I mean that 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 was what we were the weaponized immigrants, weren't we, William? Do you agree with uh, my insight to that? Well, first of all, we need to get back on track here. Okay, sure. The the what we need to do is give some people some framework information. The indigenous identity theft brief uh, that uh, Art and I have authored is very comprehensive and no matter how much people feel that they want to make this easy to basically fit their stupor. Now uh, we need to back up and, and look at the words again. One, uh, the United States of America is not a democracy. It's a constitutional republic with a democratic legislature. And the word democracy in its definition uh, is well defined and uh, it basically involves uh, its association to socialism and communism. The people in this country are right now at a point of a lot of contention and they want a social answer. They want something that fits their level of consciousness and it's not a very high level of consciousness right now in this country and that can be demonstrated historically. The situation that happened to the indigenous people is about an interdiction campaign strategy. Now if listeners don't understand or comprehend what I'm saying, they need to go on introspect and they need to pull up the case files and start learning that because, uh, frankly, I don't have the patience or wherewithal to uh, start educating people that need to literally get through kind of an eighth grade level. And I hear a lot of that. Can you say this so an eighth grader can understand that? And I've said uh, simply that there, you can speak to all people, young and old alike, and they listen. And you can speak in a way that goes across uh, various linguistic uh, patterns. But what we can't deal with is that there, there's no childlike solution to what's going on in this country. And the reason we age and we get older and we come, uh, as uh, one of our deep field otters has said, when you're young, you're a child, and you do childlike things. And then you uh, evolve into parenthood, and you, uh, man and woman, have a family. 
and they do a lot of that family stuff. And as they get older, they actually get to the point of uh, a conscious level where they can actually be teachers, whether it be uh, spiritual or material or worldly uh, wisdom and so forth. The, the things that are in play, the, the coward, uh, in fact, I misspelled it, I said coward. Well, I, I think I'll go with coward Piven strategy because basically it's about a hypnotic effect and these things are real. If we're going to really make an attempt to look at the weaponized immigration, we have to look at who's coming into this country, who's exiting it. And Hello, Pastor. what's going on is what is yes, going sir, on I is that people are coming in. Okay, I'll I'll get right back on here on Skype here. I I don't know why I've got my I've got I've got my guest on. I got Crusade. I got Blog Talk on. I don't know. I didn't see uh, that we dropped Truth Radio, but I will add you back to that. Well, wait a minute. I'm I'm calling uh, I'm calling Truth right now. Trying to. All right. Well, I'll try to get it. I don't know what's going on here, but I'll try to get that. Go ahead. Okay. So so what will happen is that as the people that come in here and want to be naturalized, they're going to have to understand that there's a matter of allegiance. All right, hold on just a hold on just a second here. We're uh, I've got Truth Radio live back up on <laughs> Skype, and uh, we got uh, William Blair, Art George, and my uh, a guest calling in David. We're all on uh, we're all on uh, Skype here now. Somehow Truth Radio dropped. I've had that problem a couple of a couple of days with Truth Radio. And thank you, Pastor Massad, for calling uh, calling in and letting me know and getting me back up. Thank you, sir. All right. Go ahead. Here, was that uh, that was Art? Was that Art or William speaking? Uh, William. What's it? That was William. Go ahead, William. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, William. Finish your thought here. Okay. Okay, so we, we have to get back into uh, not doing the same thing over again and over and over again. In the case demonstration file, and the reason Art and I looked at uh, uh, Indian country as they try to label it, is that the collaborative groups got very sloppy and very reckless in Indian country, so they were easy to see in what they were doing, and their aggression and their covert and very uh, secretive methods would surface easier and their attitude towards the, the, uh, those with low status knowledge would come out. And the framework and what, what we've looked at, and it goes on in quite comprehensive. I have to look back and say, okay, we have weaponized immigration, sure, what are the elements? What's going on in that? And we have screening points. We have screening point differentials, social, economic, legal. We have electronic screening points. And we have very important pandemic injection screening points. Now, when you look at this, it wasn't by chance that they created a constitutional free zone around the international border, west coast, east and north in the United States. It was on purpose. And it wasn't done because they were just wanted control. It was done because they could see some high, high level risk. Now unfortunately, in population exodus migrations, the people coming in are going to be screened on a criteria that's set by the, the motives, the purposes of those in the controlling regime. And unfortunately for the 
the people coming in from Mexico is they've been subjugated to uh, political ideology, uh, such as the immigration party and democracy. Now, it's easy to take people that are under stress and create anarchy because they all want empowerment. They want to get out of their risk and into something better. So it's easy to get into collective rights. And one of the major differences that the uh, people coming in from other lands are is if they came with an ideology of freedom, liberty, and that's really going to get modified as they come across into this uh, new order in the United States. And they're going to be under supervised rights and privileges. And that's a big difference. What is happening there? Who's doing this? Who and how are they doing this? Well, we go into great detail in identity theft to show how we've documented there as well as in the large document. No matter what your audience thinks, if they feel that they're going to keep this simple, if they feel that their feelings are going to guide them through this, then they are listening to their own lies. We are dealing with not a conspiracy, we're dealing with some plans as rationalized, especially what is known as capstone, and that is the combination of the military civilian authorities. And it's for interoperability. Now, it wasn't all done being stupid. It was done based on the intelligence that was skewed by various agendas. When you look back at this country, you see people that had a very interesting security network in this Amaraka, this northern place called America. And there was a security in the various small places. They were regional. And the people had a security. It was environmental primacy, and it was primacy of territory and property. When you look at the movement, the immigration movement as it's coming in, there's some prerequisites that are being implanted and injected into the minds and hearts of those arrivals. One is, you're not going to have liberty. You're, you're going to have supervised rights. That means that it's going to be, law is going to be treated as that which is to the advantage of the majority. Next, you're not going to have property the way you think. You're going to have title, and you're going to have occupancy. And then finally, you are not going to be an individual political power holder. You're going to be a decider in a group, and the group think is going to prevail. Now, we can go on a long time in this, but I want to stay focused on the what, what are we talking about? We're going into these screening point areas. And to get across that subdivision boundary, you're going to have to meet the criteria. The electronic screening points are well established, and that means that when you move across that line, that boundary, electronically, there's a, there's a monitoring system under fusion and total information awareness and DARPA. So when you come across that, if you check in, and the way you check in is not necessarily with your consent, but your vehicle, what's in your wallet, uh, chips, and so forth. So you check in whether you think you are or not. And that means that a tracking process starts occurring. Now, what happens when you bring in a population of people into a territory, you start putting them into different places and you give uh, subsidies and assistance to them. And the screening point differentials, the actual nature of the person, their, their personality is evaluated. And the, the things that are involved in undocumented immigration uh, are criteria such as uh, how are you going to manage the sector population increases? What is the environmental impact? What are the political partisan persuasions that you're going to embed in those people coming in? What's the structured social 
legal conflicts that are going to occur? Are you going to load the judicial docket with people claiming they have rights when they don't even know what they are? They wouldn't know the difference between rights and liberties. What happens with uh, special exemptions from tax and social class credits, such as carbon footprint taxation? And you can start looking at things like when you come in as an illegal illegal trespasser, felony entry, what are your rights? Well, guess what? They're not there unless you twist the meaning of that into immigrant, immigrant rights and so forth under international trusts. So what they did is they, they looked at these people wanting to come in and be naturalized, and they said, oh, join the local civil rights group. And what they did is they started misinterpreting these people coming in, which were free people in a sense, and they're going to say, well, you're not going to be free anymore. You're going to be a citizen, and you're going to have be a legislated citizen, and you'll be under a protected group and affirmative action. Now, what they did in Indian country to get at weaponized immigration is they pulled up a rationale of open enrollment. What happens when you bring this population of people in? You know, basically, you're creating open enrollment, and then they get, a, they get embedded into various community regimes. And the political aspect of weaponized immigration has now be, evolved into the immigration party. What is that about? But when you don't have an allegiance to the sovereign, you can use ideas like uh, citizenship role model, and you need to collapse it to citizenship role model of the globe. So always we end up with problems created at the global level. Now I'll give you an example on this because global warming is going to be a mandate. You will believe in global warming if you're going to get citizenship. You will do that or you won't get citizenship. There's a lot of talk about the oceans rising and the whole of thing, uh, and I was, my area was uh, the west coast, the uh, uh, northern coast and Tahola, Washington, was the Quinault uh, tribe's headquarters. So I was from Grace Harbor to Cape Flattery, basically to the Strait of Juan de Fuca. So I did studies all the time there. And what I've seen there as well as here is the West Coast is sinking. The sea is not rising appreciably. But I need to have you in the mindset that the ocean is riding, rising due to warming. My, my answer is, so what? You have the disappearing coast in Northern California that's sinking. It's sinking. The, the, the land mass is sinking, and that is the nature of the West Coast. So, but I've got to keep you thinking that global warming is rising the sea level. Really what's going on at Tahola, La Push, Nia Bay, is the removal of the indigenous people away from the river. And this was planned in the 70s and started to really come on. And we did a document called the Information Compendium, about 500 pages of how the lawyers went to work on Tahola, Ho River, Quileut, and Macaw. And what they were doing was getting rid of the Indian people. And to this day, that is still in progress, and it's accelerated through Obama's tsunami alert money. And that's really what Tohola is trying to get in on, because the Quileute's got in on it. And it's money. It's money. And it's money for what? Well, we're going to remove the, the Indian people from the river, because they don't think anymore. They just go with the, what's on CNN and, uh, and uh, their various radio stations. And their lawyers are told to do wrong, and they will do it if they're told to do wrong. Now, why are they leaving the children's schools right on the beach line if it's sinking? And why are they leaving the public facilities there? And why are they asking for economic development money for casinos in these beach line locations? So when you slow down and look at it and you get beyond the emotionalism of, uh, oh, gee, 
my poor people this and my poor people that, you get into who is really handling the situation, what's in play. And what's in play for the coast is a continuation and a gradual process of expatriating the the Quinault and the Ho and the Quileute Macaw from that very valuable beach line. And that's be getting recreated, reconstructed under zoning. Under zoning, they're re simply moving in with the uh, furthering the casino, hotel kind of thing and uh, recreational development. For whom? In my last visit to uh, the Quileute system uh, last month, I noticed two things. Nothing had changed. The Quileute Gilnet fleet was a pathetic representation of very uh, boom and bust uh, skiffs that were in really poor shape, terrible. And the the delta, the lower river at La Push, was still subject to the radical height phasing rechannelization, and certainly the Corps of Engineers was building the dikes higher. You know, if you look at the floods in Fukushima, they can build that dike as high as they want. All they're going to do is funnel that wall of water right up the river, and it'll take out what's ever there. Now, why is the Coast Guard station being left? in the tsunami zone if it's a emergency response uh, system first response marine these are the these are the quirks and what we call special structural staggers not only in the plan but in the rationale of the people that are designing and redesigning economic channeling to their special beneficiaries including the agencies so all of a sudden, we have the, the austerity. We have the poor people that need to be moved away from the beach line. And they're doing this in Alaska as well. The recreationists come in. They get rid of the mining company on the river. They put the recreationists in. And the indigenous people have to drive 200 miles to get to their ceremonial fishing zone. What am I talking about? I'm talking about weaponized immigration. And really, what will happen is that the vested irreversible interest in Quinault, Quileute, Macaw, and these different places is hardwired. Once it gets in, it's not likely to go out because what they will do, and it, this has happened in the entire Forks, Washington region, I noticed one thing. The Indian people were still the blue car class workers at the bottom. I noticed the bankers uh, white. I noticed that the preachers are white. I noticed the racial difference between the Indians still taking the low class, underclass, sumptuary class position. Sumptuary meaning you're in the underclass, you're not the aristocracy. So you have a two part system. You have those agency corporate employees and Indian reservations, then you have a big missing middle class, and then you have an underclass that's subject to grants and stipends and so forth. What will happen is this, in time, will go into the page of history. But it will go in as a wonderful thing. Uh, certainly the sophists will keep working on that global warming is caused by this, that, and the other thing. But you're always going to miss a couple things. If HARP technology and geoengineering is real, why is it not measured in the IPC elements for global warming? And another aspect that is carefully, carefully omitted and deleted is the contribution into the plasma atmosphere by microwave technology, including your cell phone. These are the parts that are not discussed because the pre-decisional criteria in all of the global warming scenarios go two roads. One, taxation, shelter, and derivative speculation, and that means cap and trade, offsets, where Indian country is not going to develop anything, and they're going to move everybody away from this, and they're going to 
if you listen to NPR and PRI International, all, this, all you're going to hear out of Harvard Project, Yale, and the rest is, well, gee, you know, we can't have uh, these little environments hurt, so let's uh, metroplex, let's stack and pack, and let's get away from the exurb, the the urban sprawl. Let's get rid of that rural thing because they're going to cause fires. Well, what they've said to me is all the Native American Indian people, indigenous people, for thousands of years in the Northwest Forest burnt it all down because they were in the woods and they were building fires. And that's another one of the major pieces of scientific perjury. You have to move everybody away from the forest because they're going to burn it down if they're there. Well, that flies in the face of indigenous history. The old force underneath the canopy, what they call the understory, are much cooler. The reprod, reproduction force, and especially those thinned, are high fire risks, and they will burn. And, of course, you're going to find that over 50% of the wildfires and forest fires in America were started by the agency corporate partnership intentionally, and they got away from them. How do I know that? I'm out there looking at it. Now, I can go on forever, and we can extrapolate, get into the details of weaponized immigration, but the important part is to understand that it has a purpose. And why are we going through these various kinds of uh, screening points? I'll touch on pandemic inde injection screening points for a minute, then I, I want Art to pick this up again and talk about what is going on in weaponized immigration today in Indian country. Pandemic injection points are where you, you purposely either run a vaccine that can cause impact and death and illness and causes people to make money at the doctor's office, it causes people to make money in the courtrooms, in settlement processes, and so forth. So they're not out. They're not out, out there being an objective solution giver. What's it is in conjunction with my Israel? Uh, I'm sorry about that. Hang on a second here. No, you know, go ahead. Uh, uh, as a range. We got. Uh, uh, instruction day for wiki right, let me, uh, editors. The goal of the day is to um, teach. What the hell did we get here? Just uh, while we're talking about the internet. I've got uh, I've got one uh, link here that I uh, I got. Israel pays propagandists to write comments on the internet. In the world. And uh, as a way of example, if someone searches the Gaza flu, but even that is a uh, is a uh, something wrong with the site. It just kind of interrupted, but. Uh, Ted brags about getting paid to listen to my show, and that it was exactly what the article was. I put it up so you can hear it for yourself. I put it up on the chat room. They do get paid to try to interrupt the show, to distract, and to talk about, you know, stuff that makes no sense and has no bearing on the show and David that's why I get irritated at you we're talking about something very serious weaponized immigration here with William and Art and I don't want to talk about the moon I don't want to talk about UFOs and if you bring that up I will kick you immediately do you I hope you understand that because I don't even know if the uh, Dr. Uh, Decharge is really the friend that I met in California. I don't know you. We can start using. Uh, you can use my internet. Uh, you can use my clay at freeamerican.com. You can use my email. That's protected. 
so I can know who you are and check with you to make sure you're all right. Because I'm not putting up with this bullshit no more. We're doing a we got a serious subject matter here with William, and don't get off the don't get off the marker. Uh, You'll have me on your ass here. Sorry, William. I just... Uh, that's, we, that's fine, Clayton. I just want to uh, you know, have our stuff again uh, with his experiences as a master otter for indigenous affairs. The uh, the last comment that, you know, we, we can have people look at the uh, well-qualified documents. Artists turned the uh, indigenous uh, identity theft brief over to the Nevada legis legislative people, the Senate, at uh, roughly 65 people now will be able to go in and look at this. And the reason was the there was a fair distribution made to everybody from the UN to local authorities, and they chose not to respond to it. Now the cat's out of the bag, so to speak, and it's going to happen at a Senate hearing level, whether the lawyers like it or not, because they will have to fess up. The last thing I want to conclude with so we can pick this up from uh, Art's view is that with all of this talk about who's a patriot and who's not, we need to understand why it, the word patriot is not uh, defined in Black's Law Dictionary, the fifth edition. I want to know why a word that has caused so much sectarian tension and if you're not a Democrat, you're you know this, and if you're not a globalist, we're looking at a confusion of rights and titles because, as one Indian attorney put it, he says, Indian country is in a stupor. Now, that didn't happen because they were in a stupor before the invasion. It happens because they're in a situation in a failed Indian reservation state where their information is screened, their services are, are very uh, constricted, and the things that have happened in Indian country happened in concert with cities, municipals, counties, states, regional authorities, and federal and international. Unfortunately, the BIA picked up the majority of the blame only because it had the money to pay back to the IRA corporations on uh, pseudo settlements. Some of the settlements that we've seen are outside of patriotism, of being a good citizen, to the point where I can't give you the name of the lawyers involved in this because the, the tribes involved will lose about $20 million if the agreement is disclosed. In other words, the lawyers will collect their paycheck check even if the settlement does not become real. If they disclose the nature of their contract, and I've read it, they would be in a position to take the tribes to commercial courts and get them not only for that but for uh, uh, quite a bit of damage money because who signed that contract. Unfortunately, these attorneys are bar attorneys, and they don't quite comprehend that they're not allowed to be in treaty settlements, and especially dealing with the sacred estates held in the land, because they can't make laws of, of pertaining, appertaining to the First Amendment. But they did and who helped them do that. Our final exhibit on who's a patriot and who's not is Felix Cohan's entire federal handbook on Indian law. Canon will be used against him. It's a confession in proxy about all the bar lawyers all the organizations and all of those admitted to practice under the states showing that they, as bar attorneys, could not honestly execute a immutable promise to their indigenous clients. Why? 
because they step outside of the judicial branch of government with more conflicts of duty and interest and ethics than you could write in a history book. And we're going there. We're going to be right there talking to a lot of attorneys and judges about their conduct in the next year. And that will be a principal item in Senate hearing on this. And the reason is, this is not conspiracy. These were protracted, executed plans, including the omission of Patriot. Because when you do that, you tell me that, well, we'll demonize the Indians as savages. And I'm staying in these modern air contexts because when you look at the word savages and you see what's going on in the pre, pre-war strikes, the extrajudicial murders and the drone strikes, you are looking at savages. And I'm talking to the drone operator, the planner, the handler, the intermediate intelligent manager, the uh, agency secretariats, the directors, and the politicians who do the lawyers' bidding. These are savages. Now, I'm not picking on them. I'm defining and saying that based on our observations under their own standards. In other words, I have a lot to draw from as an auditor, so do the other deep field auditors. We can say and walk our talk. You did this. This is terrorism. This is the definition of atrocity. And what we see going on is people who have demonized the Indian people as uncivilized and savages and everything to this day are the savages. Depopulation is protracted savagery because it's not about total. It's about moving people around in weaponized immigration. You move them into a country and you commit terrorism. Now, what is amusing is that the definition has made full circle back to the terrorist hunters. Now, they have become the terrorists by their own definition. The more they apply plausible guilt scenarios, the more they apply potentiality prosecution, the more they will indict themselves by their own standards. That's where this is going. Now, it can be stopped by what Art and I have devised as the continuity of interest. It can be stopped by getting at the truth of the matter, all things, instead of this uh, rationale, this uh, values neutral, as Art just mentioned today, values neutral. There is no values in values neutral. It's a stepping stone to destroying the flesh and blood man, woman, and any other being. And all I hear out of the false liberal quarters is uh, the transhumanism, transgender, pangender, and all of these things. They're inventions, and, and certainly someone is damaged in these inventions, always. And unfortunately, the immigrants coming in are going to be subjected to these mentalities. They're not going to be subjected to law is the collective organization of the individual's right to a lawful defense. They're not going to be subjected to liberty and the truth as a means of protecting liberty of the individual. They're going to be subjected to collective groupthink, the Delphi techniques of just say yes. That's what's really going on in the cloward Piven strategy, and it's it's been revisited. It's back again in the in this last year of this political administration. It's going to be an in surge in getting all the things in place that can be done, and it's going to be more by executive force than it is certainly by promulgating uh, the laws 
uh, through a referendum and initiative process. And collaborative governance, that's done, that's out. And But it's not reversible. And I'll just say this, and then I want to pick this up. The God tones and the frequencies, the healing frequencies, are real. And the indigenous people knew about this and used these prehistory for healing in all manners. But that has been suppressed and kept in certain quarters of the high status uh, knowledge people, those who see the high, uh, the, the high value in the big picture. That in itself was a faceless atrocity against each and every man and a woman in America, no matter where they live. Art, could you pick this up, please? You with us, Art? Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Clay. What were you going to say? No, sir. I said, told you to go ahead. Run with it. Okay. Um, it's interesting. Uh, I, I keep coming back to this. Uh, when I was born, uh, I really felt as though I had a purpose in life. And, and over the younger part of my years, I, I still felt that. And I felt part of a really strong connection to where my homeland and the people that I was born to. And over the years, it got it got to the point where where you stand alone. And I know a lot of you probably feel the same way out there. But when you get when you stand up for yourself, or you stand to a something that people don't understand, they think you're you're wrong, or you're bad, or you're doing something that that is against the grain. And and in my life, uh, my old people used to always tell me when I would share this information with them, they would tell me they said your views are really important they said but there's nobody like that anymore uh people don't listen to their dreams people don't listen to the to the value of the of the old ways they, they're uh, modernizing and they're moving into an area where they wait for somebody else to give them the answer and uh, a long time ago uh i was suppressed to where i i kind of got away from listening to my heart and 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 the connection that i had to the creator and so I've allowed people to just go on with their the ways that they have been around me. And every time I try to speak up, I would be demonized. But in uh, the, the 10 years or so that me and William have been working together, uh, it's been interesting because uh, he's really strengthened my heart again because I knew that what I felt and what I knew a long time ago was real, but I couldn't explain it. Couldn't explain how to how to... Uh, tell so many people that had no clue of what was happening and what's going to happen to us. And so, you know, I, I just uh, kept silent, but now that I'm able to really see this more, see the correlation between what William says and the, what my dreams and what my my perception of the world is, is, is coming to. And what is really important here is, is by allowing myself to sh share with all of the dreams that I have and the, and the, and the insight that the Spirit has given me, uh, 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 William can cover me in a, lot of, in a lot of places that I couldn't cover because I wouldn't have words to explain it. But uh, about, uh, it would have been years and years ago, I think I remember saying this one time to you before play, uh, um, I used to holler up the door and holler around on the river and tell people, get off your ass, you know, do something, don't just sit there and do nothing. And uh, I asked my father uh, why I was feeling this way. And he said to me, he said, you know, people aren't, don't have the same values anymore. And they don't, they don't realize how the Indian people had connected to the land, air, and my water, and each other. So they ignored the, the sense of their, their purpose. And so they kind of lost their courage by not saying anything about the way they feel. And so... And they said, and he said to me, son, be glad they don't know who you are. And 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 it dawned on me, oh yeah, okay, I see, I see what that has happened over the years is they've taken out the people that were connected to these, to the spirit and connected to the natural ways, to where if people like us that 
are listening to the Spirit can actually help those that can't hear the Spirit to again hear, the, hear themselves, to hear the messages coming to them. And so anyway, uh, I was having a little bit of trouble trying to uh, figure out what to do because I, I, you know, I couldn't get anybody to understand that we were going to be facing a lot of these problems. And, and so that's how me and William got together. But in 2000, I think it was seven, uh, I was silent until then. And then all of a sudden I had this dream. I had this dream of uh, my tribal chairman, Brian Wallace, and uh, Senator uh, Reed out of Nevada. And, uh, and Senator Reed was asking my chairman, are there any... Indians or any new washers left to give us any trouble. And our ch my chairman said, no, there's not anybody to give you any trouble. And the Senator Reed told him again, are you sure? And the chairman said, yes, there's nobody to give you any trouble. And this is a dream that I had. And at that point, when, when I had that dream, the spirit to me says, okay, now you can speak up. Now you can say what you have to say. And so what, I, what came to me was I realized that tribal leadership today are run, uh, are run by those who weren't real leaders uh, uh, like they were in the past because of their demeanor. It's like, it's like this. After the changing of uh, original values or traditional governance, the foreign system encroaching on tribes um, would have to speak to original spokespersons for the okay or support. And if the original leaders or spokesperson refused or didn't agree, then the foreign representation that is looking for uh, okay would go to the next Indian and ask him the same thing, which a lot of times was an Indian who didn't carry the interest of the land, animal, air, and water in the people in their heart or their mind. And it was self-interest and to be recognized by the whites. And... and Nowadays, when uh, I see the lawyers and the judges and the, these uh, non-Indians talk to leadership, uh, tribal leaderships or tribal leaders, they always talk to them with emotional sovereignty. And me and William ran into this up in Blackfeet country to where these leaders truly believe, these Indian leaders nowadays, these new leaders think they have sovereignty, but they don't. They only have a limited amount of sovereignty, which was given them by the Constitution that they've adopted from the federal government. And so the only people that have original sovereignty are the traditional people, the people that still listen to the, to the land, the animal, the water, and nature. And it, it's really uh, uh, something that is really important for us all to understand is, uh, like yourself, uh, Clay, you know, you, you finally realize and feel that you're indigenous Texan because you've been in this land and you've been here for your whole life and so on. And so you have the same feelings, the same dreams, and the same connections to the earth also. So you can finally comprehend what, it, what the original people uh, must feel like uh, being that those of us have been here for thousands of years, what we've had to go through, uh, getting our original voice taken away from us or uh, even uh, watching those disrespect their elders uh, and then when the elders are gone then those people speaking up saying well I love my elders I, uh, they were the res they were respected and you know they were honored yeah they were but those of you today that don't live to those same values are, are are not those those people so you can't claim to have that uh, same equality, um, you know, just like the recognized immigration, how things are brought into us in this world today. Uh, this channel that we had here, uh, uh, this Brian Wallace, he, he come and took advantage of us because of the ignorance, because of the stupor that we're in, and because of what happened to us in the past that our voice had been, our courage and our voice was taken away. So they felt as though this man was the, that, that came to be our chairman because he had these these views that, that he was a good leader. And uh, this has allowed the crooks, or those who can take advantage of the agent, you know, such as this chairman, who was close with Senator Reed and Rada and Bill Clinton at that time. 
This man that was the chairman of the tribe, this man raped, he lied, he stole, manipulated our whole Washoe system. And still, he is called a good leader by most of the the other generations here that uh, that that uh, lived with his, his, his dictatorship. And, and by those who followed in his footsteps using foreign governance. And, and so I really see the uh, representation of the original voice still existing. And I and when we think about the uh, some of the designs that William has been talking about, I, I really hear, hear and feel it inside myself that the explanations that he come up that he comes out with that it's very profound because the information really seats inside my heart that man this is how it was done this is how it's explained okay so now we can go ahead and figure out what to do because of that what the remedy is but first we have to educate ourselves and provide us our, our um, those that are like-minded to be able to absorb this information um i think about the uh uh, the the way that the, this design can come back is even for for me to to say this and to share this information and then William to say it, say it and share it his way. Um, I'm not really sure, uh, but I'd like to ask um, um, David if he's still on the line over there. If the things that we're saying and the things that we're discussing here. Um, uh, if it's um, if we're conveying the message in which it is that we're trying to convey is coming through. David, are you with well, us? Uh, Art, Go ahead. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm, I'm still on the line, and I, I was going to say, as, as far as I know, uh, what you're saying is that the message is, um, you couldn't have said it more plainer, than you and William are saying it right now, but I'm I'm 24 years old. I I see people my age, the level of intellect they have, and sometimes I wonder these days. It doesn't really matter how simple you put it to them. Some of them still won't get it because because we have been, like Clay says, programmed. For so long, we, we have forgotten who we are. Uh, in other words, we're, we're all living with the same ideas that were basically bred into us from, from birth, almost. But it seems like we're all gathered here today because we have a certain resistance to such uh, such lies and uh, whatever other words you would like to use to describe it. As a matter of fact, I was I was just watching a documentary about about the power of propaganda. How how public opinion is shaped. I mean, think about those words. You you have the power to make a mass amount of people think in a certain direction and at the same time we don't even know we're being manipulated so therefore we falsely believe we're free and we it's like i've told clay before i, I you cannot go to anybody my age and tell them that you, you're not free you know you're basically a slave the first thing I'll tell you is, oh, no, that's not true. I can do whatever the, the flying fuck I want. I can I can get in my car, go get a beer, and come home and drink it. Well, let, let's uh, say every time you complain about uh, how much how much money you're losing or how you can't find a good job, well, then it occurs to me. It's, it's economic slavery because you're restricted from conducting certain businesses and 
not being able to have a proper job like you used to be able to. And therefore, uh, crime goes up, for instance, uh, because I, I watch, I, I live in the New Orleans area every evening on the local news. It's always somebody in the city has been shot or, or somebody has committed an armed robbery. And most of the time, I, you think to yourself, now, if people had money and had good jobs and had everything they needed, like the native people did, to where they, they, they practically had no reason to steal, then you have no reason for crime. It's, it's like when Hitler came into power, everybody was put to work in Germany, and crime virtually disappeared. I mean, and that's not to say there wasn't some here and there, but, I mean, you get the general message, and I, I couldn't have said this any more plainer. And, and William, uh, I got to say, you're the kind of guy that a lot, of, a lot of your subjects I've heard before, but you give me a whole new outlook on whatever it is we're talking about. It's, it's like sitting through a, a lecture about something you heard about a, maybe a hundred times, and then you leave saying, wow, I, I just think I learned something new about that that I've never even was privy to before. And that's all I've got to say. I'd rather, I'd rather hear from you guys from here on out. Thank you, David. Is William still on the line? I sure am, David. Thank you. Uh, your uh, your age is very significant because what we see is that we see a, uh, a age group in America where you have seniors uh, that are uh, some are not trapped and they have very good uh, wisdom uh, to the point of understanding these healing aspects and the healing codes and everything and that we can turn these things around. Unfortunately. You know, here we lost the middle class because they're so stressed uh, and so uh, put into such a subjugated atmosphere that most of their day is spent uh, either uh, working to survive and then uh, do a more radical uh, distraction, the ball game thing, and so forth. And those are models. The uh, it's a, it's amazing to see the setup on weaponized immigration as they start already. Uh, tuning in to see what what sporting events are going to keep the uh, people coming in, especially uh, people uh, exiting uh, Central America, uh, South America, and what we're seeing is what sporting events are they going to be tuned into. And what I see right now is basically uh, uh, soccer is coming in. So we have football, we have baseball on these things, but football is not that popular in South America, basketball off and on. So the uh, bread and circus thing is starting to be protracted. In other words, that people think that they're going to uh, choose to have soccer, but really the money is going to be behind it, and it is a very big business. So that's that part of that maximizing distraction. And maximizing distraction is uh, what we're seeing in the in, in the uh, immigration debate. They try to frame the debate into very functional things. And obviously, there's some real hard, lawful, legal questions about what a lawyer can do as a bar lawyer and how they can represent a uh, illegal uh, trespasser uh, entry and exit. Because bear in mind. When they left, they, meaning the people, when they leave Mexico, they're committing a felony in Mexico. They cross that line, and now they've met a, a, another compound felony. Now, the people that are helping these people to do this certainly are deeply embedded in uh, the various uh, legal guilds, the bar guilds, and they're helping them because, really, their loyalty lies with the bar which obviously means British uh, credit or administrative registry. And that means Esquire. That means allegiance and loyalty to the crown. And when you dig into the, the, uh, the pre-decisional criteria of who they're going to represent, who are they really going to help, 
they're doing uh, intakes, client intakes, and they're looking for not only people that uh, aren't high-risk clients, meaning they, they can actually utilize them as a human resource, then it's kind of kind of a, a channeling process. They start setting up deep immigration for them. And it's a network that's informal and formal. And you bring people into communities and then you literally give them, uh, uh, such as they did under the uh, Prosperity uh, North American uh, NAU uh, SPP Prosperity Act, where they actually start setting people up to where they could get AFS services. And if there's an anchor baby involved, definitely you're going to see that that baby is treated, if born in America, as a citizen with all those citizenship rights. So you're seeing the letter of the law start with the, it's called a fruit of evil doctrine. First, you, you, you switch the, the name. You say you're no longer a felony uh, trespasser, an entry kind of thing. We're going to call you something that we can massage administratively. And so they created the undocumented immigrant. And these are all inventions. When you go back in and look in Black's Law Dictionary, you will not find undocumented immigrant uh, defined judicially. Uh, the same as patriot. It's not defined. So we really are looking at a, a violence against the Constitution. Now, that really bothers people who are in the so-called uh, uh, fiat liberal movement because they like those abstract words. But when you say terms that would normally be spoken by a statesman 200 years ago, and uh, uh, like uh, Blackstone said, this is violence against the, United, you know, the U.S. Constitution. Well, you're not going to hear that out of the liberal, uh, left-leaning, global kind of uh, advocates, personalities because they want as much abstract. We call this the Rothschild model. First, you abstract it, and that means you make it simple-minded, functional. And this confuses the masses, and that's called confusion of rights and titles. And in that, as that free immigrant comes into this nation, they are changed from a creditor, say possibly having $10,000 on that interesting number, to a debtor. They're no longer a creditor. They come in as a debtor, and they have to submit to various criteria and uh, economic disclosures. In the Canadian situation, you actually have to come into the country with a minimum amount of uh, assets. As we see the immigration warfare go on, if we look back into the Middle East and, and Europe and watch the weaponized immigration occur and get out of the... Uh, public radio international and the national public radio and OPB uh, sophistry and uh, hypnosis, you can actually start looking at what are the impacts. And I'm looking at the screen uh, right now on, on my file, and, and I look back at those uh, 15, um, 15 uh, criteria, what's going on, and political criteria is part of it. And if you come in as a person from Mexico, uh, Central America, and they, they have a run, they run a TIA database on you, DARPA, they're going to find if you had an unlawful uh, act in the past, because the, the records never go away. And then all of a sudden you are hereby classified, you know, and they start running risk assessment on you. And at that point, you're never going to see a day where you actually have equal opportunity realization. And I can only say that uh, there is an end game, and uh, certainly the prayers that uh, were there before the invasion and the divine conquering of uh, the North American continent here, whatever they want to call it, those things are invalid. Art and I have appeared on a, a Pacifica radio station, and, we, and I said this word, and we have talked about this. I said, the papal bowl, bowls are hereby null and void in the sacred indigenous state held in the land. That holds true for everybody because under the international trust called the Constitution, 
whether they are setting in uh, the city of London or whether they're in uh, uh, some small place here in the United States, cannot make laws about religion. And therein lies the, the nature of jihads. The jihads have become collaborating jihads. And that means this, you have the jihad of religion, you have the jihad of science, you have the jihad of uh, law, and you have a jihad of political secular persuasion. And they are all jihadists. And we've evolved in this country beyond a uh, debate about politics. Politics are those things in the Constitution of this country and the several states. But that's politics. What we're seeing is a jihad that has convoluted and diminish the credibility and integrity of the U.S. Supreme Court has become sectarian. It has become uh, hearsay. It's a voting. It's a numbers racket. And that follows through into the uh, mistreatment uh, of the plausible guilt scenarios and potentiality prosecution. Now we're at the point of really what is a patriot, what is the war on terror? The war on terror is about a state of mind. And to to indict, wrongfully indict and persecute people, they had to get difference to terrorism. And the way you do that is you progress through a interdiction strategy. Difference is a dispute. Dispute is a consensus blocking. A consensus blocking is disruption. Disruption becomes social violence. Social violence but crime, and then it, it mutates eventually to uh, terrorism, terrorism, terrorism enhancement. But bear in mind, it's turning around on itself. I just described international corporate terrorism, including when your personal entitled information, meaning your property, goes across that sovereign boundary in a TIA system, of intelligence gathering, and they treat it as a pro product, and it goes into the collaborative corporate sense, they have committed two things, identity theft and fraud, obviously, and they stole your property. Now, I'll say this, and very important for all those people that get uh, concerned with, uh, in almost to a paranoid sense, when you want to test this, you send an email to yourself. Send the email to yourself, nobody else. And say whatever controversial matter you want to talk about. In fact, uh, put in immigration, put in uh, gender uh, neutral stuff, put in uh, uh, New World Order, anything like that. Put it all in there as a controversial uh, discussion with yourself and mail it to yourself. Then track it. Then do a participation trace on it. Now, there's going to be a problem for the typical bar lawyers, the brothers in the bond. And that is, if you're talking only to yourself, the only, only other person that hears it is your server and the intelligence intermediaries and uh, espionage uh, corporates that are intercepting it. So really, they're spreading it around. So really, they could become a collateral or a joint uh, defendant <laughs> against themselves because you're only talking to yourself, and then we'll get at it. And we tested this in Eugene, Oregon, uh, on a public assembly. We went into the no, no public assembly zone, they called the downtown zone. And we held blank signs, we videotaped it, blank signs. And we went all through. We ranged from a, a Supreme Court justice, retired, down to children. And we walked around and held those signs with nothing on them. 25 police cars were within five feet of us eventually, back and around and around and around. The media would not talk to us. The surveillance people came in, made sure they took pictures of us. Now, it never went to a contest. It was a controversial thing because all we were doing was assembling. That meant that there was no way to demonize us, uh, create a, a guilt scenario, uh, a potentiality prosecution. 
And in the city of Eugenia, if you want to call it that, you're lock, looking at one of the cameos of uh, a, the fiat liberalism. It's about as liberal as the uh, feds. So what, what I'm talking about is you can turn things around. You, lawyers can be sued. Judges can be sued. Grand juries can be had outside of the control of the prosecutor. The media can be scrutinized, which we've done through our believability rating. So when they talk about weaponized immigration and they slant it and twist it, we have a response for that. It's called the media group and spokesman believability rating, and that is at uh, infospec.org. And you can look at it, and you can map. You can map how the media lies. I gave uh, this uh, to an attorney yesterday, and it was a very uh, complimentary thing. She looked at me and she laughed because she says, "Boy, this is going to take down a lot of liars." And I don't mean liars that are just, you know, uh, in a, in a uh, small sense. I mean the sophists, the uh, uh, change agents, the people that do this uh, on an institutional basis. You want to pick this up again, Art? Art? Yes. Oh, boy, there's lots to take in. Uh, I, I continue to, to hear it and uh, uh, be a part of it, but as we go and continue to um, get more in-depth in a lot of these subjects and uh, uh, clarity comes, uh, I, I, I really uh, hope that the uh, information really gets out to those uh, listeners out there and that they educate themselves even more by uh, wanting to learn more from the uh, identity theft and fraud document that we have uh, um, uh, created. Um, what William is talking about, it, it really has helped the uh, indigenous people of this land to really um, understand and describe what it is we're faced with, but also to realize and understand in ourselves that our original laws and our ways that we have acquired the uh, fundamental foundations of our um, honor and respect in our morals and principles uh, really do have a uh, cause and effect uh, within our people now. Uh, the mixed generations of, 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 of indigenous people throughout uh, South America, uh, the mixed generations believe that it's hard for them to return back to an original state of uh, belief or a belief in themselves because uh, they, they weren't, a lot of them weren't raised this way that we're talking about. But you know, it, it all comes down to the, the spirit and believing in yourself and uh, using the, the values that the original people had and that was not, not having a closed mind and uh, being able to allow the spirit to rise above the physical plane of, of belief system. Uh, the physical world we're living in, I notice everybody's uh, convoluting the physical uh, wants and needs and, and what they require as being the overall um, control of what they decide and how they make their minds up. But you know, the original people in the beginning, when we first got here, uh, we listen to the spirit of the land, air, animal, water, and the principles of the of how we guided our life came from that. And so, the younger generations just need to uh, get out of the scoop and be able to gain more clarity and and listening to programs such as uh, Douglas here and the and the, um, the circle of people that were starting to uh, acquire in the listening. Uh, because we all have something to say, and we all have a, uh, something that's going on with us in the places that we live. And if we all do this, and we gain that that knowledge that 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 enables us to make decisions and be able to communicate with each other, that we are living the original people's lives, uh, and we can actually go back to a natural form of living. Uh, uh, such as the different designs of, um, of, of, of taking care of ourselves, self-sufficiency and self-reliance-wise. Uh, 
Um, we, there's a lot of opportunity, but that's discouraged. Uh, now, my people are here. I wanted to bring that up. This whole tribal system, our organization has, has created a system to where they want us all to be under a welfare system to where they, they take care of us. Without, and when we think of entrepreneurship and um, trying to share uh, or gather intelligence from others, uh, they discourage that uh, so that we don't become self-sufficient and self-reliant. And that's an important part about uh, uh, beginning a uh, new foundation of, um, of people with morals and principles. Now, that's one of the uh, things I wanted to talk about. we just got a few minutes left, and we could devote a whole show to this. But when you were on with me uh, the other day, and we talked about the Liberty Village concept, and basing it around a uh, uh, what we are conditioned, programmed, really, to think of as an Indian village, teepees, a longhouse, and we get most of this from movies, but uh, it's a good system. It's a, it, it's a, and it's applicable, and I would. Uh, I'm really uh, believing that we could do it uh, sort of as, a, think of it like a, a Motel 6, using the teepees, using solar power, using uh, uh, new technology. It's, uh, and we can well, promote it. And, it, uh, you know, being able to check into a facility that's got animals there, got goats mowing the, mowing the yard and uh, mowing the grass and keeping the uh, bushes uh, at, at bay. As a matter of fact, I just ran across a, a gentleman that uh, bought a herd of goats and he rents them. He rents them out to places to clear out the underbrush. Rather than paying well, an illegal. Yeah, I think to me, I, I, I think what you're saying there also, it would, uh, that, that's one step towards alleviating the homeless and hungry situation. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, frankly, I'm, I'm 69 years old and I've still got my health. I'm still, uh, you know, in, in pretty good shape. But, uh, I don't want to go into an old folks home. I don't want to go into managed care. I don't want to check into a hospital and uh, die in a hospital or die in a uh, uh, old folks facility. I would like to live on a farm. I would like to retire on a farm. And the same is true for our veterans. We can set these things up so they're inexpensive and it's not like living in a box. It's not like living in a in a rest home or nursing home. We could we could change our whole lifestyles and the way our older folks and our veterans live by building on the model of uh, an Indian village. And I don't see why the Native Americans, the indigenous people couldn't capitalize on this. And this is one of the things that uh, really want to sit down with Art and talk about. I think we could uh, we could put it together as a project, put it together as a facility, and capitalize it. Capitalize it with people that... Uh, yeah, we... Yeah, uh, make a real quick comment. Yes, sir. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, William. Oh, yeah. Uh, real quick, as a a very practical uh, principle involved here, in common with, in common is not not a partnership. Partnership goes to corp corporatism, and what you're experiencing is a uh, global partnership that is not uh, uh, honest. You're looking at a uh, corporate fascist kind of a mentality, even green fascism. But just bear in mind, in common with is not partnership. Partnership is a different thing. It's a different legal instrument. In common is a principle. Partnership is a social contract. In common goes to liberty. Part, 
partnership goes to corporate doctrine. Now, somewhere in there. Yeah, that, well, that's uh, William, what, William, what you're saying is what I was uh, just going to say to Clint is uh, uh, when he's saying the Liberty Village and the things that we have in common that uh, we also got to remember the, that we're faced with, which the things you, you uh, always uh, uh, um, convey to us is there's a, uh, an agenda behind everything that's going on, and it's now not always in support of the the, the the values or the uh, feelings we get of wanting to provide uh, a self-reliance and self-sufficiency ideal. All right, we're going to have to talk about that on a future show, but uh, let's uh, let's make plans to do that because I I believe uh, that uh, William, you could help draft the documentation. What we're talking, about, what I'm, what I foresee is, uh, you know, not a corporation. Not even a partnership. Uh, what are they? Uh, there's another word for it, and I'm just lost it there for a second. But uh, well, thank, uh, thank you, Clay. Thank, thank you, Art, and thank you, Dave. I really appreciate it. Uh, as always, we we get to it. We get to where we need to be in uh, some uh, definition and clarity. All right, sir. We're out of time. Thank you both for being with me. God bless you. Great spirit, well, watch you, over you. Thank you for what you've done, what InfraSpec has done. Thank you. Thanks for listening, David.